on the lecture by Ashok Sen on the instantons, please. Okay. Thank you. So, last time we saw that every d instanton amplitude has its overall normalization fixed by the exponential of the annulus. So, today we are going to try to see how to calculate this. Okay. And there are two reasons why you want to start with this. First of all, as we discussed, this is the this is what appears in every d instant on amplitude, right. So, you have to calculate this to uh, get the overall normalization. And also, this certainly looks like the simplest uh, diagram, okay, simplest worksheet diagram. Now, even though the methods that I will be describing are quite um, general, okay, and they, are, they can be applied to any theory, we will focus on a specific theory, okay, so that everything is very explicit. So, we will focus on a specific theory. And this will be the two dimensional string theory. Boson extreme theory. Okay. So, let me describe what this two dimensional boson extreme theory is because it is probably not something that uh, everybody is familiar with. So, 2D boson extreme. So, the wall sheet theory has one free scalar x. This will basically give the time direction and then another interacting scalar, scalar which is also called the Liouville theory interacting scalar or Liouville and this is uh, the parameters are chosen so that it has central charge 20, 25. So, total central charge of the matter system adds up to 26 because a free scalar has central charge 1, this has central charge 25. So, total central charge is 26 and then of course, it has the usual BC host system, BC host system. With central charge equal to minus 26, well, that is the standard bosonic string theory except that that 25 of the scalars I have replaced by one interacting scalar which we call the Liouville. Okay. And this theory is very simple because if you look at the spectrum of closed string states, this describes a single massless scalar on a half line. So, this half line is basically parameterized by the Liouville direction because there is an interacting scalar a chi L right. So, which in the from the uh, target space viewpoint will describe a uh, 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 coordinate system a, a particular coordinate direction in target space ok. But because it is an interacting scalar there is a potential ok. So, there is a potential which takes this form okay. and because of this potential the uh, essentially the space is halved. The, these closed strings cannot really go on the other side, okay, at least not perturbatively. Okay, that is the sense in which we have a theory on a half line. Okay. And the x of course describes the time coordinate. Okay. So, it is a 1 plus 1 dimensional theory of which the space direction is has this potential which effectively makes it into a half line. Okay. And the important point is that this theory has a d instant on. 
has d instant on okay and since by definition d instant on have Dirichlet boundary condition along the compact and along the non compact direction, okay. it should have Dirichlet boundary condition along x and chi l. Okay, this is also sometimes called the ZZ instanton. Okay, because Zamola Chikov and Zamola Chikov discovered this, this instanton. So in this theory, we can calculate this annulus diagram. Okay, and later on I'll explain in a little more detail what goes behind this calculation. And this has the form of an integral that we have already seen. Okay, if you recall, I gave this as one example of an integral that will appear in the lectures, and this is where it appears. Okay, the annulus diagram for the instant terms of this theory. And this one clearly is divergent, right? It diverges as t goes to infinity. This one is ex diverges exponentially, this one diverges logarithmically. And our task is to try to extract finite result out of this. Now often we may Think of the di these divergences as arising because we are dealing with bosonic string theory. Okay, and one might expect that perhaps when you go to super strings, these divergences will go away. So you can compare what happens in type 2b. Okay, this is this theory has a d instant on. And in this theory, if you calculate this you get an integral like this. So this I have written it as 8 minus 8 because this 8 comes from the Nebuchadnezzar sector. These are the bosonic state contribution and this comes from the Ramon sector. Okay, if you are not familiar with this language, it's roughly bosonic sector and the formionic sector of the open strings. Okay. And indeed, it does look like it, the situation is better because this is a zero, right? And you would think that, okay, this is zero. So the exponential of the annulus is just one. But if you really take this as the answer okay. and go ahead and calculate various amplitudes, okay. you will get results that are co in complete contradiction with whatever you know from S duality, for example. Right? S duality gives that, does give some prediction for certain the instant on amplitudes. And the result that you find by taking this equal to 1 okay. does not agree at all with what S duality predicts. So this is not the right answer. Okay. So the lesson is that even Sometimes in superstring theory, you may think that okay, divergences have cancelled and hence we can proceed. Okay. You really cannot cancel divergences of this kind. Okay, you have to separately interpret the divergence that you see in the Nebuchadnezzar sector and the Ramon sector and then try to get a result. So I just Give this example because I'm, once in a while I'll refer back to this case. Okay, just to show the similarities between the uh, two situations. Yes. Uh, in this 2D bosonic string theory, are there tachyons? Two dimensional string theory as? Are there tachyons? Are there tachyons? Yes. No, there are no tachyons. This massless scalar actually is what we call the tachyons in uh, bosonic string theory. But in two dimensions, okay, if, uh, this is a Liouville direction, right? So the Liouville direction has this linear dilaton field, and that basically makes what would be the tachyon in bosonic string theory into a massless field, mm. right? And so this tachyon, the tachyon is in this, this massless scalar field. Mm. So there is no tachyon in this. So this is a fully consistent string theory? At least perturbatively. Perturbatively, it's a fully consistent string theory.
Any other question? Yes. It didn't, it works, it works. I didn't fully get, where Where are the numbers eight and eight coming from? Is it the eight and eight directions you can uh, Well, I'll explain this. I'll explain where this eight and eight come, come from, right? Because this, there is some subtlety here. Okay, now, to make sense of this, We will need to make use of string field theory. And as you heard yesterday, this is a bitter pill. So everybody wants to run away when string field theory is mentioned. Okay. So what I am going to do is to try to give you the dose in small amounts, right? so that not everybody runs away at the same time. Okay. So let me, at this stage, just give the bare minimum of what you will need, okay, at least for the next few steps. Then we'll give, I'll give you some more details okay, when you need them. So for now, we need to know the following facts. First, is that string field theory is like a regular quantum field theory. Is a regular QFT. QFT with infinite number of fields. Okay. And basically it's infinite number because there is one field for every mode of the string. And since string theory typically contains infinite number of states, that's why you have infinite number of fields. Sorry, regular in the sense okay, of this. Free uh, of UV divergences? Yes, it is free of UV divergences. Okay. Yes, indeed. Thanks. It's a free of UV divergences. But otherwise, it's like a normal quantum field theory. Okay, it's free of UV divergences because the interaction vortices have some kind of exponential suppression in momentum, okay? and that's why it's, uh, 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 it's uh, UV finite. Okay, but otherwise, the Feynman rules, etc., are all like in normal quantum field theory. Okay. The second point okay. is that it is designed to, at least formally, reproduce the world sheet result for scattering amplitudes. For S matrix. Because it's not a new theory. It's just a, a, a formalism which is designed so that you get back the usual scattering amplitudes. Okay, but of course there is some difference, that's the sense in which it's formal, and this hopefully will become clear later. And the final point that will be, that is specific to D instantons, is that the string fields describing open string modes on the D instanton live in zero space time dimension. Okay. 
And that's because the D instantons are point-like objects, right? They are localized in space and time. Okay. And since open strings live on those D instantons, right, they also really move in zero dimensions. Okay. Sometimes there may, the, the D instanton may have compact Norman directions, right? But those compact directions, of course, you can de uh, decompose into appropriate harmonics, right? So as a field theory, it's still a, uh, a zero dimensional field theory. And this means that a path integral reduces to ordinary integrals. Because this is what you should expect that when you talk about path integral over open strings living on D instantons, so we should really see some ordinary integrals. Maybe over infinite number of variables, maybe over finite number of variables in special cases, but it will be ordinary integrals, okay, not really path integrals. Now let me write down the general formula. For this one. Okay, that, that one was written specifically for the case of two dimensional bosonic string. Okay, but the general formula for this is take the following form. And the z of t, z of t is given by case of minus 1 to the f, e to the minus t times L0, b0, b0, c0. Okay, I'll, I'll explain this. So the trace is taken over all op open string states. On the D instant one. This F for us will be ghost number plus one of the state. Okay, so I have to define the host number. So host number is defined so that C has host number 1, right? I introduce a BC host, B has host number minus 1, and matter has host number 0, right? So X and chi L have host number 0. Has host number 0. Okay, and once I have given the host numbers of the fundamental fields, you can find a host number of any state that we have. So that's what enters here. The important point is that the statistics is related to host number in an opposite way. So if the host number is odd, this is thought of as a bosonic state. If the host number is even, this is thought of as a fermionic state. L0 is the scaling operator. So this basically measures the conformal dimension of the state, right? the standard where zero generator. And this B0, C0, okay, these are the host zero modes. Okay, B, C on, on the annulus, both B and C have zero modes. Okay. The reason that this is inserted in the trace okay, is because this is, this essentially projects, this is a projection operator, this projects to states satisfying states that satisfy B0 acting on psi equal to 0. Now this is sometimes also described as that you have to insert the host to soak up the zero modes. Okay, on the annulus there are host zero modes. Okay, and unless you soak up the host zero modes you get zero. A simple way to see that 
that that will happen is that imagine that you have a state S that contributes to the trace. Okay, imagine that you have a state S with such that B0 acting on state equal to 0. Then you can build a whole tower of states by S and C0 on S. Okay, if S is there, C0 on S is also another, another state in the spectrum. B0, of course, you cannot apply anymore because that annihilates it. Okay. So these two have exactly the same L0 eigenvalue, right, because you are applying a zero mode of C. And they have opposite statistics because C has ghost number one, right. So if S had even ghost number, this has odd ghost number and vice versa. So they have opposite statistics, their contribution will cancel out in this race. To get a non-zero answer, we have to insert this projection operator, okay, so that this state is not there. Okay, we basically this projection operator removes this state. Okay, and now this and uh, uh, z of t is not identically zero. Okay, so this is sometimes what is called the uh, that you have to soak up the ghost zero modes, but this also uh, comes as part of the wild sheet rules. Okay, wild sheet rules automatically insert this ghost zero modes into the correlation function. So with this understanding, we can also write z as sum over b e to the minus hbt minus sum over f e to the minus hft, where hb and hf are the L0 eigenvalues. bosonic and formulaic states. Is this okay so far? So now you can see the where the problems will be. If you look at that integral, right, typically from the lower end there is no divergence as long as you have a consistent string background. From the upper end we can see that the problematic cases are when HB or HF is uh, uh, non-positive. problematic cases are when HB or HF are less than or equal to 0, right, because that is where the large T divergences come in, because Z is not sufficiently damped at large T. So what we will do? Sorry, oh. question. Uh, yes. what, what about the possible divergence at t equal to 0? Yeah, so what happens, you can see that this, there is not divergence from t equal to 0 and here, right? In this, so in this case, yeah. Example. So typically, oh, the t equal to 0 end is the closed string tadpole channel. And as long as you have cancelled closed string tadpole, right, which is necessary for consistency of the string background, the t equal to 0 divergences get cancelled. So it's not, so it, it happens here, but this is generic. Right? As long as you have a consistent closed string background, you do not get any divergence from the t goes to, goes to 0 end. Okay. So the strategy will be to start with cases which you understand, right? That consider first HB HF greater than 0 cases and rewrite the expression in the string field theory language. Now, 
And then once you have done this, then we use the same language. Then you use the same language. for HBHF less than or equal to zero cases. Okay, so that's well, what we'll try to do. Uh, how is this strategy different from the standard uh, analytic continuation uh, on the metamorphic uh, plane? Uh, the point is that here there's no, analytic, no, no parameter here you could do analytic continuation, right? Normally there is some momentum that we use to do analytic continuation. Okay, I see. So this cannot be interpreted as analytic continuation in HB or HF. That's right, yeah, exactly, right? In fact, we will see that for HB negative, okay, we can in some sense think of this as analytic continuation, but for HB and HF equal to zero are the problematic cases, right? There you really have to use the full insight of uh, uh, string field theory. Thanks. But strictly speaking, even in HB, we cannot do analytic continuation because string theory gives you a fixed value of HB, right? And there's a consistent theory with a, a slightly different value of HB, for example. Okay, so now let's write down some identities. So some, these are identities for HB, HF positive. The first one is an integral 0 to infinity, the dt over 2t, is square root of hf over hb. Okay, these are mathematical identity, you can check. Okay, I will not uh, prove this. If you don't believe it, you can put it on a computer and check, right? Put in various values of HB and HF, it will come out to be right because uh, everything is finite here. The second identity is HB to the minus half is, can be written as integral d psi b over square root of 2 pi. where psi b is a Grassmann odd even variable. It's a standard Gaussian integral. And then similarly, there is a identity involving the HF in the numerator, which is integral duf dvf. Okay, where these are Grassmann odd variables. Yes. So uh, this uh, sum is over all uh, this uh, all states which are physical or unphysical. Is that yes, everything? Yeah. All so, open so I'm just trying to understand what are these problematic states. I, I would have thought that uh, physical states, which are BRST uh, cohomology states, should have positive weights with respect to some physical L0. I mean, uh, we will write down explicitly those states. Right? Uh, but are these uh, gauge? I mean, are these uh, are there physical states which have this property, or these are mostly BRST trivial states, which are no, they are not BRST trivial. Not BRST trivial, but... Yeah. Uh, so certainly, I mean, there will be zero modes, for example, which are physical states, which have this property. Many uh, of these, the zero modes, zero modes are typically physical states. Uh, okay, zero modes, but yeah. the negative ones? Negative ones are not uh, physical, but uh, they are still there. If you just throw them away, you don't get the right answer. Okay, okay. Right? I mean, you really have to include everything. Right? And then, here there are no positive ones, but often there are also positive ones. 
which are again not uh, uh, VR state invariant, right? they are unphysical states, but again you have to take, take into account their contribution to the uh, partition function. So, uh, because it has something to do with the zero modes, is it, is it some way of implementing the collective coordinate quantization in partly, field, field theory? Partly okay. it is okay. collective coordinate, but partly it is something else that we will see. Partly something else. Okay, yeah. okay, thanks. Now, one technical point okay, is that you see we have in this identity you have square root of u. HF, but HF always comes in pairs. Right? This is a general observation that uh, I mean, when you uh, have this uh, uh, sum, okay, same HF appears twice. So even though individually you have square root of HF, once you take the product, you always have uh, integer powers. Okay, that's how you can make use of this. So with this, we can write this exponential of this as integral product over b product let me write it prime Just one minute. There are, there are logs when you are there in the exponent. Oh, yeah, yeah. In the log, sorry, sorry. HF yes, over indeed. log HB. Yeah, thanks. The exponential of this. Yeah. So there are logs in this integral, right? But you have to exponentiate it, and that, that's what gives you this. Thank you. Any other question? So this prime basically means that we sum the, for the formulas, we take the product of our pairs. Okay, that's why we, we because each of each integral gives you a HF and not square root of HF. Right? So you sum over this, the, we organize the sum over all the formulas into sum over pairs of formulas. And now the idea is that this integral we are going to interpret. interpret as path integral over open string fields. Later we will see, we will write down the open string field theory action and then we will see that this is indeed the open string field theory action. Okay. But for now, we have already got this from our starting point. So let's just proceed with this. Okay, we interpret this as a path integral and this as the action. questions? Okay. So now, first let's look at this. Now, okay. So now the idea is that we have got this by for HB, HF positive, but now we are going to use this as a definition of the whole thing. Okay. Even for when HB and HF are uh, negative or zero, right, we'll take this as the fundamental description of what this annulus exponential of the annulus partition function is. Okay, if you had started from string field theory, this is the kind of expression you would have, you would have gotten in the first place anyway. So first, let's look at the HB less than zero states. HF less than zero actually is not a problem at all, right? You can see here because the Grassmann integrals. So you just get back HF. HB less than zero. What is it saying? HB for HB less than zero, if you have an integral like exponential of minus half HB psi B square, 
this exponent grows along the real psi axis. But this means that the it is a saddle point, right. This is not a minimum of the action, it is a saddle point, right, because along the real axis the action is growing. But whenever you have such situations in a path integral, right, the normally the way we deal with this is to integrate along the steepest descent contour. Okay, so you do not integrate about the real axis, you will integrate over the steepest descent contour, which in this case is the imaginary axis. So integrate, so for h b less than 0, we integrate. along the imaginary axis since that is the separation contour. Okay, and the answer that you will get by doing that is basically 1 over square root of Hb, right, the same as this 1 over square root of Hb, okay. except that because Hb is negative, this is imaginary, okay, and the, the fact that it is imaginary, you can interpret by saying that because of the fact that they are integrating along the imaginary axis, the integration measure has a factor of i. Right, that is what is responsible for this being imaginary. Okay. But the answer otherwise is just 1 over square root of Hb. Okay. And this in a sense you could have said that okay, you are just doing analytic continuation from this expression right, to negative value of Hb. Right. So, that sense it, it is indeed equivalent to analytic continuation. Uh, sorry, is not there some sign ambiguity? Yes, there is sign ambiguity, right, and that sign, sign ambiguity has to do with the fact that the steepest descent contour can be chosen either uh, along the positive imaginary axis or along the negative imaginary axis, right. So, this is a choice ambiguity in the choice of contour, and then you have to use physics to fix the correct choice, right. You have to use input from physics to fix the correct choice, right. You have to start with the original integration contour and then see how you can deform the original integration contour so that you get part of the steepest descent contour. Okay, this is the same as in quantum field theory. Uh, is there any natural i epsilon prescription uh, that one can use here uh, to uh, fix any ambiguity uh, of? You can in the sense that I mean we will see that the unitarity for example, mm -hmm. right, will put constraints on what kind of sign you should uh, get, I right. I mean in particular the d instantons, right, will give imaginary part of the into the closed string amplitude. Right. And the way we interpret the imaginary part is that we saw that the, 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 uh, the closed string fields live on a half line, right. And the imaginary parts basically tell us that the uh, particle can actually leak through that wall, okay, go to the other side. But that means that the actual scattering amplitude should be less than 1, right. S dagger S should be less than 1, not larger than 1, and that fixes the sign. Thank you. But if we are uh, if you do not worry about the physics, right, it is up to you uh, how you choose the contour, right. When you have defined an, uh, I mean that is true in all, all quantum field theories. If you are given the action, right, you have to also tell us how to, how to uh, what contour you are doing the path integral over. Any other question? Now, you notice that this kind of argument does not solve the problem when Hb and Hf are 0. Because when Hb is 0 for example, right, you are just doing integration over psi b without any damping factor. When Hf equal to 0, you are doing integration over the uf and vf without any uh, 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 dependence on uf and vf. So, Hb integral, sorry, psi b integral naively will diverge and Hb integral, uh, uf vf integral will naively give you 0, right. And this is where the insights from quantum field theory comes into play, right. You have to understand the origin of these 0 modes and then use the insights from quantum field theory to deal with these zero modes. And this is what I will try to describe now.
So origin of Fusanics, origin of zero bonds. So bosonic zero modes okay these kinds of zero modes also arise when you are doing standard instant calculation in quantum field theories right? and those typically describe uh, 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 reflect the fact that the instant on solution breaks certain symmetries and these are the goldstone bosons of that symmetry Right. For example, in uh, four dimension, if you have an instant on solution, it breaks transition invariance because it's located in space and time. Right. So it will have four zero modes that tells you the degree of freedom to translate the instant on along the space and time directions. So, at least one class of bosonic zero modes okay, will come from broken symmetry. Typically, arise from. arise from broken symmetry. Okay. So for example, for D instantons in 2D string theory, 2D bosonic string. We have, we break translation invariance along X. So we expect one zero mode. Along the chi L direction, there is no transition invariance anyway, right? So you don't get zero modes from that direction because there is a potential. The instant on is fixed along the chi, chi L direction. In 2B, we break, break 10 transition invariance. Because you have a point-like object in 10 space-time dimension. Right? You can move it anywhere along those 10 directions. And so you expect that there will be 10 bosonic zero modes. So now let me describe how we deal with these uh, zero modes. Okay, and let me let me again focus on this case, two D string theory. So the fact that we expect that there should be a translation zero mode, okay, basically uh, another way of saying this as that this zero mode variable, let me call this phi b zero. Because general psi b have used for all the modes. So let us say psi b 0 is a particular 0 mode. This is related to the d instant on position along x. y along x. So you expect a relation like psi b0 equal to some constant k1 y and there may be higher order corrections to this relation that we will not worry about right now. Okay. k1 is some constant. Okay. 
Okay. Later on, we will see how to calculate this constant. So once you have understood this, right, then integral psi b0 or d psi b0 is k1 times dy. And now we can see that the integration over y okay, has the interpretation of the as the interpretation uh, as the integration over the Dean Stanton position. Okay. So the fact that the Dean Stanton has to be integrated, the position has to be integrated, okay, is already encoded in the world sheet expression in the form of a zero mode. Okay, there is a divergent quantity here, right, and that sort tells us that we have to integrate over the Dean Stanton position, right? Because one of the zero modes has the interpretation of this transition mode. But once you have identified this, then you can use insights from quantum field theory. When you have an instanton in quantum field theory, there also you have this collective mode, the position of the instanton. But the rule is that you, ca you calculate the, you, you do the integration over the position of the instanton at the very end of the calculation. Okay, you have to put everything together and then you integrate over the position of the instanton. Which in this language means that once you have separated out the integral this way, okay, then we don't try to calculate this directly. Okay, we calculate the full diagram first. This with all these, for example, right? The leading contribution, as we saw, has annulus times all the disks. We first, so we first separate out the zero mode integral. Okay. Then the integrand, we calculate the product of everything. Okay, not just the annulus, but annulus and product of everything. From the annulus, we have separated out the zero mode. Okay. These have Y dependence, because the results for these depend on the, if the d instanton is, placed at position y, right? The, the, this diagram knows about y because the boundary condition is dependent on where the Dean Stanton is put. Okay. So what one can show is that the dependence of this on y has the form of e to the i e times y, where e is the total energy of all the closed rings. So you keep the y integral undone in the intermediate stage. At the end, when you do the y integral, okay, we this y integral okay, gives integral dy e to the i e y, which is the energy conserving delta function. So in other words, even though individual disk wall sheets didn't have the energy conserving delta function, right? Because I told you that because that the boundary condition breaks energy conservation. But the energy conservation is restored at the end after you do the y integral and in a very precise way, right? You get this 2 pi delta i and you have this factor of k1 that tells you how to relate psi b0 to y. Okay, this is something you have to calculate. Is this clear? In the case of type 2b d instanton, you basically get 10 factors of this k1. Right? It may not be the same k1, maybe some other constant, but you get 10 of these factors because there are 10 transition directions. Yes. You determine k1? I didn't get it. How do we? Yeah, how do you determine k1? We'll, we'll do it. Ah, okay, I mean, for that, you need sorry. the second dose of string field theory. Okay, so okay. that's why I'm postponing it, right? It's some constant that you have to calculate. Could I, could I imagine that maybe I, I would cheat and I just put a small potential along the x direction, compute the integral and get rid of the potential afterwards? You could try to do that. There are various ways. I don't know whether you can do it with small potential, but basically the way you, uh, the, the, okay, the philosophy will be that we know that y dependence of the amplitude is of this form, right? It will be i e y. Now you look at how psi b couples to the amplitude. Psi b is a uh, open string state. Right? You have to correctly normalize it, find its vertex operator, and basically calculate the Walsh diagram to see how this couples to the rest of the closed strings. And that by comparing these two, we can find the relation between, we'll find the relation between psi and y. Right? But normalizing this psi b requires a little more detail about string field theory, which I'll do it, uh, do eventually. Thanks. Now, again, since Although super strings are not what I'm going to discuss here, let me just say that 
for type 2b super string for d in centon in 2b super string we have 16 fermi on zero modes This, this is because the D instanton breaks 16 supersymmetries. Okay, so there will be 16 Fermi on zero modes. Okay. And so you expect a minus something there, that, that, that's the contribution for Ramon sector. Okay. So this is responsible for the minus 8 from Ramon sector. Now, why it's minus 8 and not minus 16 is a technical point. Basically, what happens is that we wrote down the expression as this, but for the Ramon sector, actually this is square root of HF. Okay? So, there is another factor of square root because the Ramon sector involves what is called the super conformal generators. Okay? So, that is that's, that's the reason why even though you have 16 zero modes, you see it as a minus 8 in the partition. But anyway, this is not what we are going to discuss today, but the general philosophy is that whenever there is zero mode, okay, you have to take into account in the same way that you do in quantum field theory. You have to integrate over the zero modes explicitly, and again you do it at the end of the calculation. Are there questions? Now, if you just go back to the expressions that we had written down, okay. you will find that the numbers do not quite match. Because we said that we found one zero mode, right, for in 2D boson extreme. we found one zero mode. One bosonic zero mode. But if you look at the expression for Z of T, it's e to the T minus one. e to the t basically means that there is an hb equal to minus 1 state. Right? That is just reflection that this is a saddle point. Right? There is an open string tachyon on the d instanton. But you would have expected a plus 1, right? because we found one bosonic zero mode. Right? So, you should, have, you should have gotten plus 1, instead you have got minus 1. Right? If you look at 2b in 10d, Okay, there you have written down the expression for ZT as 8 minus 8. Okay, this we understood, this is Ramon sector. This we understood from the zero modes. But you see, you would have expected 10 zero modes because there are 10 directions in which you can translate the D instant on. Right? So, this should, this should have been 10. Right? Instead, you are getting 8. Yeah, so, somehow we have not counted all the zero modes, right? something is missing and what is missing is the same value in both cases, we are missing a factor of minus 2, right? because you would have gotten plus 1 was the natural expectation, we are getting minus 1, here you should have gotten 8, we are getting minus, uh, we are getting, uh, sorry, you should have gotten 10, we are getting 8. Okay. So, what I will do now is to write down the other zero modes, right, which are missing. And that is a point where this is the case where things differ a little from usual instantons in quantum field theory. So, the 
additional zero modes. These are I write down the states in the CFT or Z, the vacuum and C1, C minus on vacuum. Okay. This is SL2 or infinite vacuum. So B0 annihilates this and B0 also annihilates this. Okay. There is no C0 to uh, protect this. So these satisfy the correct uh, projection condition. These have L0 equal to 0. Right? This clearly has L0 equal to 0. This is the vacuum. Right? And this has L0 equal to 0. Sorry. C minus 1, C1. This has L0 equal to 0 because total L0 of these two add up to 0. So these 0 modes are present in the open string spectrum. Okay. And in the language of string field theory, they are going to give two Grassmann integrals. Right? And you have to understand then how to deal with these two Grassmann integrals. Right? So these zero modes are responsible. These are responsible for getting some integral like du dv without any weight factor. So goal will be to find the interpretation of these. Now it turns out that these arise from wrong gauge fixing in string field theory. So the result is that these arise from wrong gauge fixing of string field theory. But what I'll describe do first is to explain this by using just a gauge theory description. Okay. Later on, we'll see explicitly how this happens in string field theory. But we'll first try understand what is happening just by using gauge theory description. Uh, can we explain what you mean by the word wrong here? We'll see. That's what we'll explain. Right? <laughs> okay. That's what I, I'm going to explain now. What is wrong with the gauge fixing, right? So, for this, we have to go back a little, okay. and instead of talking about Dean's sentence, let's consider just general DP brain. Okay, then. P equal to minus 1 will correspond to D instant term. Okay. So take a DP brain, a DP brain, this is any, any theory with P plus 1 dimensional wall volume. DP brains always have U1 gauge field. This is probably one of the first things that was learned about D brains that D brains carry gauge fields. In particular, if you have a single D brain, it, has, it carries a single U1 gauge field. Okay. And one would expect just from a gauge invariance that it will be the effective action will be given by Maxwell action. 
So, string field theory action for these fields is this I write integral d p plus 1 x minus 1 quarter f mu nu f mu nu ok. This is where you would stop for a Maxwell action, but string field theory gives you a little more This phi here is an auxiliary scalar field. Question? Yes. Uh, typically on the d brim world, world volume, uh, we have a DBI action. So uh, why don't uh, we use something like that? You could have used it, but you don't, I mean, uh, for this purpose, we are just calculating the annulus diagram, right? Hmm. So, this quadratic terming the action is enough. Ah, okay. Uh, right? For perturbation. Actually. Yeah, because this diagram, right, hmm. we are just calculating one loop uh, yeah. vacuum diagram, right? Hmm. For that, you only need a quadratic piece, hmm. right? Exponential of minus i b square or whatever, right? Yeah. So, dvi action just becomes this. Uh -huh. In the low energy limit. In the low energy limit. Yeah, I think I made a. We are using Euclidean, so let me put everything in class. Okay, this is the form of the action. Now, this is an auxiliary field. In fact, you can just integrate out phi, right? And uh, eliminate this and you get back the usual Maxwell action. But string field theory gives you this. So, let me keep it as it is. And if you are wondering where this, what this phi field is, right? Let me just say, I'll also maybe give the mu field, what states in string theory they correspond to. Right, this is the, these fields probably have already seen if you have gone to some of the white sheet calculations. So, A mu corresponds to the state C1 alpha mu minus 1 on the vacuum. Okay. So, this is the vacuum that carries momentum k and these are the oscillators of x. So, in the same language, the phi field corresponds to C0 on K. No, this is in the gauge invariant form. This is gauge invariant. I am going to write on the gauge transformation also. Then you just get this. Right? Because this is quadratic. So, you can just shift phi, call declare this as phi prime and just integrate out phi, right? That just gives you uh, some constant factor in the front. So, this is completely gauge invariant uh, form of the action. The only thing wrong about this phi is that this does not satisfy the B0 on phi equal to 0 condition. Okay, but that from the perspective of string field theory that B0 on state equal to 0 is a gauge condition. Okay, we are here you are writing the gauge invariant form. So, you do not impose that. Okay, so, that is why this phi is there and once you work out all the couplings you find that the action has this structure. Yeah, so that is what is normally called the Seagal gauge, right. So, the world sheet expression that I gave you, right, is something that comes out of string field theory in Seagal gauge. Right. So, the particular wall sheet action you had is exponential form, right? That you will get as a string field theory action in the Siegel gauge. Okay, but right now let us not worry about uh, those. Um, all I am saying is that the string field theory gives you an action of this form, okay, with an extra scalar. 
And it, in fact, does a clever job. I'll explain why, right? In fact, it's probably a little more clever than just Maxwell's form of the action. So the gauge transformation laws are delta mu. OK, I'll just normalize the transformation square root of 2. This is a standard gauge transformation law of gauge fields. Theta is a gauge transformation parameter. This is clearly invariant. And you can easily convince yourself that this is also invariant under gauge transformation, right? Because this goes as box theta, and this goes as box theta. This transfer to a box theta. So it's completely gauge invariant form, right? Now, the way string field theory gauge fixes, okay, which is what is called the Siegel gauge, and that's what gave the annulus partition function. So gauge fixing in string field theory just sets phi equal to 0. Okay, phi transforms under gauge transformation, so you can set phi equal to 0. And that, that, that's the gauge choice. So once you set phi equal to 0, okay, the action simplifies, the action just becomes integral, you can do some integration by parts, minus half a mu box a mu, you recognize this is a Lorentz gauge action, this is a gauge fixed action, and you have other proper ghosts, right? And the ghost kinetic term is just the determinant, as I just, uh, it's just computing the determinant of this box operation, right? Because you have set phi equal to zero gauge. So the ghost, it's, it's easy to read out what the ghost kinetic term is. So the ghost kinetic term is box. So A's ghost will be integral B U box. All of them are TP plus one X. So if you are doing on a DP brain, U and V, these will have carried momentum, K. And string field theory action will precisely give you this U box V kind of term. Because the string field theory automatically knows how to gauge fix, okay, how to introduce for of ghost, etc. And you would have gotten, everything would have been consistent. Yes. But this does not fully uh, fix the gauge, because you are still free to perform gauge transformation with box, te box theta equal to zero. Yes, but those are residual gauge invariants. Yeah. Right? You don't have to fix them. Because for doing Feynman diagrams, it's enough that you fix the gauge transformation law, uh, a transformation that is parameterized by a function of four variables. Mm. The residual gauge symmetries are always there, right? Even in normal electrodynamics, you have this. But for perturbation theory, you don't need to fix them. Okay. So the, if we had done the same annulus calculation, not on a D instanton, but on a DP plus, uh, DP brain, okay, you would have gotten a similar expression that is what he uh, got. And that corresponding action would have included these terms. Right, everything is, I mean, these, because these will be the L0 eigenvalues of the various states. But now, you see what will happen if you try to apply the same procedure on a D instanton. So if we apply this on D instanton, First of all, on the D instanton, there are no gauge fields. 
because mu runs from 0 to p plus 1, but p plus 1 is 0 for the instant term. Okay. So there are no gauge fields. Okay. And there is no space time because these are zero dimensional fields. So box u box v is 0 and no gauge fields. So if you took the same formalism that works for dp plus uh, dp brain okay, and just naively applied it on the d instant term, you would have gotten an integral like integral du dv with no action. Is this clear? Right? If we just take the formula formalism that the uh, uh, string field theory gives for the uh, gauge fields okay, and just apply it naively on the d instant term, this is what you would have arrived at. And this is the source of the problem. Right? This is the divergence that the, this is the zero mode integral that you are finding. But now that you have understood where these u and v fields are coming from, we can go back and check what is wrong, right? What we did wrong there, right? Why isn't it working for D instant term? Okay. And the problem goes back here. You see this, because we had delta phi equal to box theta, right? We fixed phi equal to zero gauge. And this works for all uh, uh, DP brains. Right? But on D instant term, Delta phi is zero. So this means that you shouldn't fix phi equal to zero gauge, right? It's not possible to choose phi equal to zero gauge because phi is gauge invariant. So this is the source of the problem, right? This is the reason why you are getting this ghost with no kinetic term. But once you have identified the problem, we also know the solution. is to don't gauge fix. Okay, because I mean you are not supposed to gauge fix because phi is gauge invariant. So this integral du dv, you have to replace by integral d phi exponential minus s, let us look at what minus s is, right? This is phi square, right? The action is phi square. Let me write to minus s, but s is just phi square. Okay. So you have to do the phi integral and you have to divide by the volume of the gauge group. This is the volume of the group. So when you add this term, I guess the number in front of s is very impo imp important, right? It's minus one times phi squared. Yes, yes, indeed. But is it obvious that this one is fixed because you write this action, but I could multiply this action by another number or not? Yeah. So you could multiply by make it into two phi, right? right? But if it's two phi, then this will become two box theta, right? You wanted to bring it back to box theta. So theta also has to be multiplied by two. Right? So this in, in this integral, then you will get 2 here and 2 here. So this ratio will be independent of uh, that normalization. Right? It is true that, uh, the, I mean, if phi you could uh, uh, rescale, right? But then you have to make sure that theta is also rescaled appropriately. Okay, so this is an elementary integral, right? So this is root pi over integral d theta. Okay, and now you have to figure out how to calculate this. The volume of the 
you want there to. Okay. But the volume measured in this parameter theta. So the strategy for calculating this is that you have to compare the gauge transformation generated by theta to the standard gauge transformation law Here psi corresponds to any open string state whose one end lies on the D instant. Okay, those are the ones which are going to transform under the E1 uh, uh, transformation. Okay. So this is a standard gauge transformation law. Okay. In terms of alpha, the period is 2 pi. Right? Because alpha and alpha plus 2 pi generate the, generate the same gauge transformation law. So if we can find out the relation between theta and alpha, we are done. So let me state this here. So if If theta is k2 times alpha, this is some constant again. And then again, if this has higher order corrections, okay, but which will not be relevant for this particular calculation. We have integral d theta as k2 times integral d alpha, which is 2 pi k2. Because alpha period is 2 pi. Right, alpha and alpha plus 2 pi give the same gauge transformation. Is this clear? So then the final result, well it's not final yet because you have not done all the calculations. So final result is that exponential integral This is to be replaced, first there is a factor of i, right? that is the hb equal to minus 1 mode. <coughs> then there is a factor of k1, that came from the psi b to y, remember psi b 0 is equal to k1 y. Then you have the square root of pi from the phi integral. divided by 2 pi k2, that is the theta, that is the volume of the gauge group. Okay. And then you have finally integral dy, okay. but this we know will eventually generate the 2 pi delta y term, delta y term at the end of the calculation. Okay. So if we can calculate k1 and k2, we are done. Right, that gives the overall normalization. Is this clear? Now to do this calculation, to calculate k1 and k2, okay, we need a little more details on string field theory. Okay. Basically the point is that we have to normalize, we have to find a normalization of this zero modes properly. Right? And for that you have to understand, I mean we wrote, we said that psi b0 is a zero mode. Right? And what do you know about psi b0? Okay, that it appeared in the action that the general way we normalize psi b, okay, or that it should appear in the action as it to be minus half hb psi b square, right? That is the general normalization that we use for psi b in writing the annulus partition function as this integral. Okay. So this in principle fixes normalization of psi b, okay? Once you compare this form, so we compare this with the open string field theory action. Okay. 
This will fix the normalization of psi b. The normalization of all the psi b's at once. Okay, in particular, the psi b, that particular mode, will have a associated state or a vortex operator, right, which will be fixed, including its normalization. Okay, once you fix it, okay. then compare coupling of psi b to closed strings and that of y to closed strings. Y coupling we already know, that is e to the i e y, okay. that is the way the y couples to control strings. So, you by making this comparison, we will we'll be able to fix this constant k1, okay. that appears. So, this gives psi b, psi b not equal to k1 y and k1 will be fixed. And a similar strategy will be used for for comparing theta with y. Right? Theta as it stands is a string field theory gauge transformation parameter. But you have to understand, so string field theory gauge transformations are of course known. So you have to see how a string field theory gauge transformation parameter theta as normalized, normalized as you have given actually transforms an open string whose one end lies on the d instant on. Once you find that, then you compare with this transformation, okay. say for infinitesimal alpha. And by doing this comparison, we will find the relationship between theta and alpha, okay. and that will give us the k2. Okay. And once we calculate k1 and k2, and then that that that's it. Okay. We have calculated the overall normalization. Is that okay? Are there questions? Yeah, I think I have seven minutes, so let me begin. Uh, actually, it was until 12.15. Oh, really? I yes. Think. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I over went over. A little bit. Over okay. Time. Sorry. Thank is, you. Is this a good time to stop? Yeah, yeah. Or? Sure. yeah, yeah. Okay, so time. let's thank Ashok now.